And thank you very much for joining us this evening, everybody. And thank you very much to College of Radiologists for giving me the opportunity to tell you about what I think is probably one of the best jobs in the world. Actually, I take it back. It's probably one of the best jobs in radiology. Um, so what I do is a uroradiologist. That's not me on the screen. Um, that's one of my sons. It's something I aspire to do, but I'm not that good. Um, so let's go on. If I can get my next slide to move. So what do you do? It's one of those party conversations, isn't it? Um, it's not as obvious as it is for this guy. Um, what I do is Euroradiology. I'm based in Newcastle upon Tyne, um, which as you can see in 2012 held one, one of the hosting cities for the Olympics. And I work in two hospitals, mainly the Freeman Hospital you can see at the top here. This is the older part. This is the posh PFI newer part, and that's the RVI on the bottom, and the newer part of the RVI on the right hand side. So what I want to do is take you through a week. Um, I started radiology training in Newcastle some time back. I was then lecturer in interventional radiology in Dublin in 98 and did a reasonable amount of Euroradiology then. And I was appointed at Freeman in 1999. I was a founding member of the BSUR, uh, secretary then chairman. Um, I'm currently secretary of BSIR and still do a lot of active work with the BSUR. Doing some work with Prostate Cancer UK, the college and the BSUR at the moment to promote multiparametric MRI of the prostate gland, mainly resources, and trying to iron out some of the postcode lottery we've got around the country. I'm also doing some work with BSAR in promoting interventional radiology. And in my spare time, of which there's very little, I run a dev device review website called Which Medical Device? It's got a lot of IR devices on it. So my week starts on a Monday. I spend most of the Monday in endourology theatre working with an excellent group of urology colleagues. We spend a lot of time doing PCNLs. We'll do three to four a week, um, a couple done by me, uh, two or three on a Monday, and the rest done by one of my colleagues later on in the week. Uh, we do PCCLs, which is percutaneous systolithotomies. That's taking out big bladder stones percutaneously when urethral access isn't very good. I'll show you some of that in a moment. I also help the urologists with the urethrorenoscopies and uh, use a few tricks that we use in the vascular tree that they're not very familiar with. I help them with supercubic catheter insertions and some of the more difficult stent changes. So let's whiz along up to under urology, out of my office along the dingy corridor, past some of the ultrasound rooms, and round towards the sneaky back stairs. Now the CQC have been in in the last couple of days. We didn't show them these sneaky back stairs. So they go straight up to theatre. We get changed and we come along and we go into under urology theatre, which unfortunately is one of the smallest theatres, so it's slightly cramped. Um, but it's got excellent stuff in it. We do a lot of complex stone patients. Some of these have got a very bizarre anatomy, uh, especially the patients with spina bifida. We do all the image imaging work up for these patients beforehand. And as part of that, we have a weekly stone or lithotripsy meeting, um, which is mainly aimed at planning lithotripsy, but also includes some of the patients for PCNLs. This is the sort of thing we used to get a lot of. Um, this is your typical young Newcastle patients. I'm sure if I had your microphones unmuted, I'd hear you rolling around with laughter at the piercing in front of the patient. Um, nowadays, we do a lot of CTKUBs. Um, we, can, we can reformat these in any plane, and this really is the best way for planning our stone therapy and planning the PCNLs. This is one of our patients with um, really extreme anatomy. This was about six months ago. And this unfortunate gentleman's got bad spina bifida. His head's at this end, he's prone on the table, ready for his PCNL, and you can see he's got this very large hernia from the right side of his abdomen. And this is the side we're doing the PCNL on. Um, so for that, we had combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy access, and actually it turned out to be a relatively straightforward procedure. So in our theatres, we've got a mobile CR. It would, in some ways, it might be better if we had a fixed system, but this gives a lot of flexibility in the theatre to move the equipment around. Um, we've got an anaesthetist who's very keen to turn patients prone, has no problem with it. Um, here's one of our patients prone, ready for a PCNL. We don't do these supine PCNLs that some places have done. We've, we've dabbled with them. Haven't really found them particularly beneficial over the prone PCNL. So we do it with the table broken to stretch the patients back out and open up the gap between the iliac crest and the lower ribs. And the team in theatre are very slick at turning these patients prone, and we really do it very, very quick. Um, get them prone and start doing the PCNL. Now, the other thing that's important and something I go on about a lot in our trust to my colleagues, particularly, is radiation doses. And we use this thing called the Race Safe, which is great. So these are Bluetooth badges that connect to this box on a stand. 
in the corner of the theatre or in the IR room. And these badges give you a real-time reading of your dose. So wherever you stand, when someone's got the foot on the screen pedal, you can see your dose going up and down. So you can see the best place to stand and what sort of protection you need. So we have a lead screen at the side here um, to protect my legs during PCNLs. And the urologists don't forget, um, during the first part and during a lot of their procedures, we'll be sitting between the patient's legs down here. And they'll get a lot of scattered dose going up straight to where they don't really want to be getting scattered doses, probably under the lead apron half the time. So this is a recent innovation we brought in once we started measuring the doses and we realised how high they were. We do most of our PCNLs, in fact, the only time we don't use these metal dilators is when we do a PCNL course and we show people how to use the balloon just so they know. But all our PCNLs are done with these metal dilators, which are graduated dilators. They're reusable and they're very cheap and they're relatively easy to use. I'll just run through that with you now. So we've got two wires in, we've got good access. So we've got one's a safety wire. There's a ball on the end of this first dilator and that stops the second dilators going any further. And there you can see it passed in onto the stone. We then put the next dilators over it, rotating them in. And gradually these dilators get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there is a little bit of skill involved with this, particularly when the kidneys start to push away from you, because what you don't want to do is have the, the dilators relatively pulling out of the kidney. We then pass this um, amplat sheath over the outside. It's got a 32 French external dilate, uh, diameter. Pass that down all the way down to the stone. The advantage of these metal dilators, of course, is a very blunt end once they're all together. You can see it there. There's no taper, which means you can get right down to the stone with a stack on calculus. Um, my urology colleague will then get the nephroscope and he'll go in and take out stone fragments with some assistance from me. Now, in some places, the radiologists will come in, they'll do their access, they'll get the wires in, and then they'll disappear off and go and do something else. But in our trust, we, we stay in theatre the whole time during the PCNL. Occasionally, that can get a little bit tedious. But the reason we do that is because there's things we can add to the procedure that the urologist isn't necessarily familiar with. And some of the catheter tricks we can do, um, getting them into calluses they couldn't always get into. All these things can help. So we do stay around. This is how you, this is the balloon, this is a Nephromax balloon, this is the alternative means of access into a collecting system. It's very quick, it's not as, it's not as cheap of course because this balloon is just single use. And over the balloon you pass the unplanned sheath. So one of my colleagues putting one of these in. And again you can see we've got the two wires in case one wire gets pulled out during the procedure. We've got a safety wire for access. So the balloon's being put down into the collecting system. This patient had quite a difficult anatomy as it turned out. And you can see the balloon, the marker on the balloon there. And as we inflate it, you see it start to dog bone. And then finally, it'll dilate all the fascia around the kidney. And then you can slide in the amplat sheath over it. The disadvantage of this, apart from the cost, is if you've had a patient who's had a lot of PCNLs, there can be a lot of scarring around the kidney. And you can actually fail to get rid of all the wasting on the balloon, no matter how high a pressure you get it up to. Um, but most of the time, this is a perfectly satisfactory way uh, to gain access to the kidney and dilate the tract. So then you take the balloon out, and then from then on, the rest of the procedure is the same. Put the nephroscope in and take the stones out. Now, this patient had very unusual stones. These are called jacks stones. Um, they're like the game of jacks. And these are stones that are often formed in the bladder, and I've never seen in the kidney before. And if you have a look at the shape of these, you'll see them down the nephroscope. They're like, um, they're fairly rounded, but spiky. Quite an unusual appearance. Uh, never seen that in a kidney. And we took these out and then it's the end of the procedure. Um, sometimes you can't get to all of these stones. Here we've got a lower pole tract and we've got a flexible cystoscope through it, which was guided by this catheter, but you can't get the angle to get onto these stones. So this is one thing that we can do that the urologists weren't familiar with before we started doing it. We put a shape catheter in. And actually what I've put in here is a Sos Omni catheter or a Shepherd's Crook catheter. I've pushed it in, then pulled it back into the calyx. I then get two 10 mil syringes of saline and I flush fairly hard. And there's stones here and stones here. And if you watch what happens to these stones, they get flushed down. Let's just go back and you see they get flushed down into the collecting system. And then you can get the nephroscope in and just fish them out. And it means we don't have to go and puncture that calyx. We use this technique a lot. Another thing we do is what's called the needle push technique. 
So this stone sitting just behind the 12th rib, we've got lower pole axis, the urologist can't quite get round to the stone. So what we do is we percutaneously push the needle all the way down onto the stone, guided with fluoroscopy. It requires a little bit of a sixth sense to get the exact depth you need for this, but you then push the stone and get it into view so it can be removed with the grasping forceps. And there you can see the needle through one of these calyces with a couple of stone fragments there. The other thing we use a lot is we use baskets. This is something called the N-gauge basket, which has got an open end on it, um, which is useful because it means the stones don't can, tend to get stuck in it. And that's if you bite off more than you can chew when you're trying to get a big stone out through the access sheath. So you'll see when we finally grab this stone, um, this is through a flexible scope, we'll be able to just pull it out. This is another way of getting at stones that you can't reach uh, with a rigid scope. So what do we do at the end of the PCNL? How do we make sure there's no bleeding? Well, we used to leave in what's called a 28 French Euro drain, and the theory for this was it was going to tamponade any bleeding. But the reality of this is any bleeding that's significant is going to be arterial bleeding, and the Euro drain is only going to tamponade it as long as it's in. Once you take the Euro drain out after 24 hours, the bleeding will start or shortly thereafter. Um, and it, most bleeding you get during the PCNL is venous bleeding and it will just tamponade itself. What you really don't want to do is CT the patient just after a PCNL because then it's going to look absolutely awful. We then started leaving in nephrostomies. You do need to leave some form of external drainage in case you've got some edema in the ureter or any small stone fragments that you haven't managed to cut to catch or any blood clots that could be causing um, ureteric colic. So you do need some drainage for the next 24 hours. Then what we've moved on to doing is leaving in an anti-grade stent. The advantage of the anti-grade stent is that the patient's got nothing hanging out of the skin. In theory, they can go home sooner, or well, there's no reason why you couldn't just pull the nephrostomy out fairly quickly. And uh, the disadvantage, of course, is a lot of patients, that's 20 to 30% of patients, will get irritative, irritative symptoms from the presence of a stent going out down into the bladder. The other thing is they'll have to come back after a couple of weeks and have a flexible cystoscopy and have the stent removed. So these so-called tubeless PCNLs um, are not uh, necessarily uh, the right thing for every patient. We do have some patients who insist that they don't want a stent. They've had them before and didn't like them. Could you get away with leaving nothing in? Well, yes, in the odd very select case you could, um, but it's not something we do routinely um, because you do get caught out and run into problems with obstructed patients and have to go back and stent them. At the end, uh, we either stitch up the little tract or we leave in, um, we just close it with some cyanacrylate adhesive or super glue. It's basically what it is. And that works very well and gives a very neat result. The other things we get asked to help out with are PCCLs and suprapubic catheters. The access is very similar. So all suprapubic catheters now should be put in with ultrasound guidance. Frequently, this is a sonographer. Um, helps with this but in this case the patient had a very small bladder which was difficult to distend and um, so I was doing this ultrasound guidance you can see some gas in the bladder and on the left side here you can see the wire being passed in and you can see it through the cystoscope which the urologist got in the bladder per urethra and that's a very straightforward procedure this you then just rotate rotate in a peel away sheath over this stiff guide wire once the peel away sheath is insufficiently, you'll just see it coming down there. We can take the middle bit out, there's a flood of urine, and you can push in the Foley catheter. Then you just inflate the balloon. And pull it back up and peel the peel away sheath away. Very straightforward procedure basically, but ultrasound really is essential. Uh, to avoid any bowel complications. Now this is a particularly interesting patient. I apologise if any of you have seen this case before. I presented it at BSUR a couple of years ago. It's a 34-year-old man with progressive renal impairment and loin pain. Now he had um, bladder atrophy, or extrophy, sorry, and, uh, and had a cutaneous urostomy performed as a child. So that means his ureters were taken out onto his skin. Now, nowadays, patients would have an ileal conduit where they have a bit of ileum interposed between the skin and the ureteric anastomosis. But here, his ureters were pulled straight out. And this is an old-fashioned IVU, um, which hopefully you'll never see anymore. But you can see there's a loosened filling defect in the renal pelvis, in the calyces, down this ureter, 
and also in the other kidney here going down. Now this loose and filling defect was a bit of a puzzle. We didn't know what this was. So we got him to CT and we became even more puzzled because there's fat in the retroperitoneum, fat on the other side. There's gas in the collecting system, not surprising because it refluxes up the ureters. But this in the middle is very similar density. In fact, we measured it. So it's minus 84 Hounsfield units and this fat was minus 108. So could this be fat? Well, we'd actually seen this once before, 10 years earlier in another patient. And what this turned out to be when we looked into his kidney was stoma adhesive. So this is the adhesive put around the stoma, um, the, around the bag and flange that he has over his cutaneous urostomies. And this adhesive dissolves slowly in the urine and refluxes back up his ureters and has gone into his kidneys. So we thought, great, we'll take this out with a PCNL. So we went in, did the PCNL, and everything got stuck. The wires got stuck. The forceps got gummed up. That's when we put the ultrasound suction probe on to try and suck it out. And that all got stuck as well. So in the end, we gave up, closed up the hole, and he went to theatre, open operation, and this is what we saw, and this is what was taken out. So this is a perfect glue cast. And this is a jelly-like sort of glue of his collecting system. After that, um, he had an ileal conduit formed, and since then it hasn't been a problem. I think there's only three cases of this reported in the world so far. Very unusual complication. This is something else we see, a medullary sponge kidney, uh, quite a pretty thing in neuroradiology. You can see on the image here, it's x-ray KUB, um, so no contrast, then the IVU with contrast, and then more inferiorly, the coronal CT KUB, or CT IVU with excretion of contrast. And you can see the stones here actually within the medulla, hence the name medullary sponge kidney. And the sponge bit comes from this appearance in the kidney. So when you look into the collecting system, you can see all these tiny holes, and these are the collecting ducts. And in these dilated collecting ducts, because you have status of urine, as you do in an obstructed kidney or, or a bladder that doesn't drain, you get stone formation. And here you can see the tip of the calyx, and here you can see all the stone behind it. And the, some of the stones form beneath the mucosa. And eventually these stones erode, and they pop out, and they drop down the ureter and cause these patients renal colic. Um, so you might think it would be a good idea to preempt this and go in and take out the stones when you can see them sitting in there. I'll show you what happens if you try and do that. So this is a laser. There's the mucosa. These are the stones. And you can cut through all that mucosa with the laser very, very easily. And you open a whole bag of worms, really. You get all these stones coming out. They all float freely and they scoot around the collecting system. You then get a basket and try and fish them out. And of course, they're too small to go through the holes in the basket. The reality is these aren't really a problem at this size and you can usually irrigate these and flush them out through the PCNL tract and get rid of them that way. This sort of scenario is where a supine PCNL is very good because small stones like this will just drop out under gravity. So that's something we've never done again since really and every time the urologists go to try and do it I strongly discourage them. So they don't really fancy two hours in theatre to trying to fish these stones out. So that's pretty much my Monday. And the Tuesday, um, Tuesday morning, I have a one and a half hour in inverted commas all sound list because this usually overruns horrendously. I do four or five biopsies and drainages during this hour and a half, and sometimes it takes a bit longer. So I do focal renal biopsies, some non-focal, the ones that the nephrologists don't really fancy doing. If the patient's a bit overweight or they've got a sultry kidney, liver biopsies and anything else that really is within reach of a, a needle and a strong right arm. Um, we do drainages, abscess drainages. The other thing I do a lot of is my pre-ablation assessments. So I have patients with small renal tumours who I do um, microwave or RF ablation on, on a Thursday morning. We'll talk about that later. So I see them all in ultrasound beforehand and talk through the procedure with them and explain what's going to happen and also check their fitness out and check their suitable for it. We also do other sort of Euro-specific ultrasounds such as patients with erectile um, erectile dysfunction or stroke ultrasound. Lunchtime I teach the registrars. Um, we go through some interesting cases that we've had during the last week or so, stuff that's been seen on call and then sometimes some IR cases or specific topics we teach such as loin pain or hematuria. 
In the afternoon, I have an MRI list, and we also do some specials, as we call them. Um, that will be things like urethrograms, cystograms, and looking at allele conduits. So this is something from my ultrasound list. Yeah, I know this isn't an ultrasound. Um, this is a CT, an unusual CT. And if you look at the kidneys, they look a bit moth-eaten and patchy areas of low attenuation and almost a rim of low attenuation around the cortex. You see it a little bit better coronally. Really very unusual appearance. So we've got the patient into ultrasound and it's much more striking with high resolution ultrasound. You can see this low reflectivity area. We didn't know what this was. Um, There's quite a wide differential. We had a good inkling what it might be. So we went ahead and we did a renal biopsy. And um, we did a CT a couple of months after treatment and the kidneys look back to normal. And some of you probably guess what this is. Um, it could have been lymphoma, I guess, but this turned out to be IgG4 disease. This is what it is. It's a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate rich in IgG4 positive plasma cells with fibrosis. And it also causes this tubular interstitial nephritis and can lead to renal failure. And it's usually very easy to treat medically quite often with steroids. Now, another thing I did recently, which is quite interesting, um, to do with the renal biopsies really, it says new league, there's actually a new colleague joined us about four or five years ago and he had this large renal mass he wanted to biopsy. He wasn't happy with the sample and he went back to take another sample. Um, it's a big mistake to go back and look again but if you're going to take another sample you really have to and what he came across was an expanding perirenal hematoma with a prominent jet of blood and he came and knocked on my door and said, well, Phil, what do you think we should do about this? The patient's fine, but the hematoma is getting bigger. And this is what it was. This is the mass. And this is on ultrasound. There's the jet of blood. There's the Doppler showing the jet. That's the hematoma getting bigger. So I ran up to IR and I got some thrombin. I got a syringe of thrombin, 22 gauge spinal needle, and directed it down onto the jet, which you can see here. And that's the flarings from me injecting the thrombin. And there you can see the jet's gone. And that stopped the bleeding. Yeah, I know what some of you are saying. The bleeding is probably going to stop anyway. But the problem is this patient was then going to be sent back to the ward, which is quite a long way away. Um, we didn't know it was going to stop. And of course, once you've seen the bleeding point, you think, well, really, we ought to do something about it, particularly if you've got something simple to use that's relatively non-invasive, like injecting a small amount of thrombin, which of course is how we treat pseudoaneurysms as well. So a very good treatment. Some of the other things we have in ultrasound, this is microvascular imaging. This is not Doppler. Um, it's a relatively new technology. I don't fully understand, but it really gives you exquisite detail of this kidney. If you look at the size of the vessels you're seeing in this renal cortex, the so normal grayscale image here and the microvascular imaging on the other side. So one of my colleagues, Andy McNeil, does quite a lot of this and is really at the forefront of this sort of imaging. Um, when I see my patients for pre-ablation, it's generally during the, towards the end of my ultrasound list, I'm, I'm assessing their general fitness. I'm checking they're not on anticoagulants or they've not got any contraindications to ablation. I discuss the procedure and I start the consent process. And they're always a little bit surprised when it's me who's meeting them rather than the neurologist who's sorting out patients the week before. Um, but it's quite good that they can then put a face to a name. And it's at this point we make the decision to treat. So that's when the clock starts for the treatment. So there's the patient supine and there's a small renal tumour I'm going to treat. I turn them prone, check I can see it well on ultrasound because ultrasound makes the procedure a lot quicker in CT. So I tend to use both together. The specials list, um, we get all sorts of weird things on this. This is a 16 year old who had minor perineal trauma and he had a bit of post void leakage. Uh, may or may not have been due to his perineal trauma. They weren't sure, so they asked for a urethrogram. And this is what we saw. So we use a little HSG catheter, that's for hysterosalpingograms, put a little bit of air in it, a couple of mils, and then put the contrast in. And you can see there's his urethra, and he's got this bizarre thing parallel to it, which goes all the way back, almost to the prostate gland. And there's a glandular bit of oak filling there. So a very strange appearance. This is on MR, there it is there. There it is alongside his urethra. Here on a high resolution T2, you can see it extending posteriorly. And that's that little glandular bit you could see on the retrogrades that on the urethrogram. What this is, is called a perforate syringa seal. It's very unusual. Uh, it's a cystic dilatation of the Cowper's duct. There's two versions, open and closed. 
the open communicates with the urethra, and the closed often presents with obstructed symptoms. This is the one and only time I've seen one of these. Um, so next time I see one, I'll probably know what it is, I hope. MRI, Tuesday afternoon, was into the MRI department. We've got two scanners here. We're all a bit embarrassed to be on the video camera, I think. Not the scanners, the radiographers. So on the right, we've got a magneton solar, which I think is the first one in Europe. It's just been installed recently. And here we've got what's called an Avanto Fit. So this is our old Avanto scanner, which has pretty much been gutted and, uh, and refitted with um, new magnets and coils. And that actually does give very, very good imaging now. So we've got two fairly decent scanners, both one and a half Tesla. Um, ideally, we'd have a three Tesla, um, but unfortunately, we can't have one of those, we're told, at the moment. So my MRI list, again, is very varied. Um, I do a lot of prostate imaging, benign and malignant disease. I do some vascular imaging, renal artery stenosis, prophalangiograms, MR venograms in patients with leg edema, previous DVTs. Obviously, there's a lot of uroradiology, evaluating renal, renal masses, um, looking at unusual uh, or atypical bladder TCC. Uh, generally, we find MRI doesn't really alter the management of TCC of the bladder, but occasionally it can do. We have patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease, and patients with uh, autosomal dominant poly polycystic kidney disease, um, where we're assessing, that we're assessing the renal volumes, and that's a very quick scan to do. And the reason we assess the renal volumes is they're often treated with uh, serolimus, with very expensive treatment, and the nephrologists want to know whether the treatment's working. We get patients with urethral diverticulae we have to evaluate, and patients with post transvaginal tapes that have been inserted. Now this is something that was in the press a lot in the last year or so and these are the things that are eroding through on some patients and they're actually very difficult to image with MRI. Of course MRI is also good for stones. Um, don't tell the urologist this but some would argue it's better than CT. It is apart from for the smaller stones. So there's a small renal calculus in the lower pole of this 17 year old. It's also very good in pregnant patients of course. So let's move on to prostate MRI. Um, there's been a big sea change in this in the last, in the last few years. Uh, the current pathway um, really hasn't been very good. Previously, patients have been having prostate biopsies then when they were diagnosed with cancer going on to have an MRI. But prostate may miss, the, the, the ultrasound guided biopsy, of course, can miss significant tumour and then for the patients under treatment, under treated. It could also biopsy an area of insignificant tumour and these patients with insignificant tumour could then be treated unnecessarily with quite a high associated morbidity. And of course, once you've done a prostate biopsy, you've got hemorrhage in the way, and that can make interpretation of the MRI harder. And that hemorrhage can last for six months or even a year. Um, so really, this isn't very good. So for some years now, a lot of people have been trying to do MRI pre-biopsy of something called multiparametric prostate MRI. And this has come about really with improvements in scanning technology, improved confidence using diffusion weighted imaging and dynamic contrast enhancement. And so there was a very good paper published in The Lancet in January 2017 called The Promise Study. And what this looked at was to see whether multiparametric prostate MRI before biopsy could safely exclude prostate cancer in men and also avoid the need for biopsy in these patients, because if you could say on MRI, there's no prostate cancer, why would you then go on and submit them to the potential morbidity and even mortality from having a prostate biopsy? We'll just skip through this quickly, but not surprisingly, it found that multiparametric MRI was much more sensitive than trust biopsy. It was of course less specific, but what it did show is that you could reduce the number of men needing prostate biopsy by 27% which is truly, truly significant. And they also said that if MRI was used to direct biopsies afterwards, 18% more cases of clinically significant cancer could be detected compared with the usual pathway. So this has led to a sea change, and this is what we're doing now, or at least half the countries doing now. So what we do is a high-res T2 scan, we add in diffusion-weighted imaging, and you add in dynamic post-contrast gadolinium MRI. So this is called multiparametric MRI. So the field of weighted, weighted imaging is a type of echo planar imaging with very rapid MR gradients. 
Uh, that's the physics for you. We'll skip that. And it really assesses the diffusion of water molecules in different tissues. And the way this works is that diffusion of water is restricted in tightly packed cancer cells. So you use three different gradients. And from that, you calculate an ADC image. I'll show you this in a moment. So you have a B200, a weaker gradient, a stronger gradient, <coughs> excuse me, and an even higher gradient. And as you go from the weaker gradients through to the higher gradients, you can see this tumour anteriorly lights up and it becomes very much more obvious. But you also lose signal from the surrounding tissues. So you can't keep going higher and higher with this B value unless you've got a three Tesla scanner where you can take it up a lot more than that. So here's the same patient and you can see the T2 weighted imaging. It looks dark and it looks very black on the ADC. This is the apparent diffusion coefficient, which is an amalgamation, if you like, of those three different B values. And this is what you're looking for. Tumor enhancement is also important. Prostate cancer shows early and more prominent enhancement compared with a normal gland. And more aggressive tumors have got more blood vessels. So they tend to enhance more. So we give gadolinium. And then you very rapidly repeat the gradient echo sequence about every 10 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds, over a few minutes. And you see the contrast washing into the gland. And that can show you where the tumour is. I'll just show you an example of how this works. 70-year-old man, PSA 38, abnormal DRE, digital rectal examination. And the urologist said there was a nodule in the right lobe of the gland. Here's the MRI. There's the axial T2. There's the D1400, there's the ADC, and there's the post gadolinium in image. Just shows you should never believe what's written on the card. The tumour's on the left, there it is on T2, there it is on the V1400, there it is on the ADC, and there it is post contrast. Why do post contrast? It's debatable. I think it helps in some difficult cases, and it gives you an extra bit of confidence. In this case, it's pretty obvious where the tumour is, but sometimes you're not so sure, and the post-contrast does help you decide. You can fuse the diffusion image, the T2 image, the diffusion-weighted image, and get these nice coloured pictures. Um, personally, I don't think it really helps, um, but some people like to do that. How do we score these? Now, you will all have heard, or some of you will have heard about PIRAD scoring. This was um, brought out by the European Society of Euroradiology starting in 2012 with Pyrads 1 and they've then produced Pyrads 2 and soon to be Pyrads 3. And this looks at specific features of a nodule within the gland to score it to say whether it's likely uh, to be tumour or not. Now, this was really an educational tool when it was brought out and still is, I think, um, but was very much being jumped on the bandwagon by some people, particularly the Americans. But what we're using, and I think, is much more pragmatic and practical thing is a Likert's five point scale. And this is what we used in a consensus paper we produced in 2018 in BJU International. And it's also what the Promise study used uh, that showed that multiparametric MRI um, was better than trust biopsy. So what this does is it uses the five point scale. So it looks at the likelihood of the tumour being present and it, and it really uses the features described in PIRADS2. Um, you can grade individual lesions, but the difference between PIRADS and Likert's is Likert's take into account the family history, the age of the patient and the PSA density to give you a whole gland score from one to five as to whether you think cancer might be present. So this is really a much more holistic approach and realistic rather than just looking at the lesion by itself. So it goes from highly unlikely to highly likely. So how do we get this done across the country? How do we get everybody doing this? Well, it's difficult because, as you know, we're short of over a thousand consultant radiologists nationally. Um, what we're doing is we've got an online training module on multiparametric MRI, uh, which was produced um, with the BSUR and Prostate Cancer UK. The URL for it you can find at the bottom here. It's a free course that you can do. You can just sign up on the Prostate Cancer UK website. And I think there's a link from the RCR website as well to this. The other thing we're doing is we're running national courses through the BSUR, the College of Radiologists and Prostate Cancer UK. These are run nationally all over the country. And there's one coming up in February, uh, which un unfortunately is already fully subscribed. But I think there's going to be one shortly after run by the college in March. So these are all things to get us up to speed with this multiparametric MRI. 
The other thing we're doing is we're trying to produce an online training tool um, that you can use with an app on your phone with patients sent to your workstation and you can score yourself against your peers a bit like they do with the performs for, um, for mammography. This is really a training tool rather than um, something to beat people over the head with really. And ultimately we might move on to specialist online re reporting if we ever have enough radiologists to do this. So prostate MRI, big change and it's a change that's still ongoing. So moving on to my Wednesday morning, um, here we tend to review the, all the stone patients being considered for lithotripsy, that should be an I, not a Y by the way, and look at some of the PCNL cases as well. That's a 30 minute meeting, which I do just before I move up to interventional radiology. So this is on the first floor along from the urology theatres. We'll just gallop along the corridor. This is in the Freeman Hospital, into the interventional radiology department. You can see we did this just before Christmas, Santa's on the door there. We've got a little room on the left, the mobile II. On the right we've got a um, three bed recovery area. But the main IR rooms are through here. And this is into the control room. More embarrassed people Morning. seen on video. And this is one of our slightly newer <laughs> bits of kit, although this is probably about five years old now. And this is one of the older bits of kit which is due to be replaced yeah. this year. So we've got the two main interventional rooms. They're both equipped for GA and uh, we can do a lot of procedures in these. The other room's got Dyna CT or Cone Beam CT, which is very useful. I do a variety of intervention. It's obviously fairly Euro heavy. I do a lot of nephrostomies, anti-grade stents, some covered ureteric stents. I'll show you some of those in a moment. Nephrostomy changes. I do some vascular work, but I don't do EVARs. I don't do TIPS. Not that I couldn't, there's just not enough time in the week and you need to be doing these things a lot to, to maintain your skills. I do some GI work, which is mainly gastrostomies, jejunostomies, biliary work. Um, biliary work in a way is very similar to Euro work. Um, techniques are all very similar. Um, tumor embolization, um, often bone tumors pre-surgery to reduce the vascularity. Obviously on-call emergency embolizations. And we're doing quite a lot of prostate artery embolization now, PAE, for benign prostatic enlargement, which used to be called BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. The other things we do, um, this is something you might find interesting, this is nephrostomy, um, but this is using, using your phone to do it. This is Philips Lumify, you've probably seen this now, it's been out for a few years, but we got hold of one of the first ones, and you can connect a bit of kit up to either an Android phone or an Android tablet, and you can use it for intervention. Now you'll see that's actually a patient's neck, well it's not, it's one of our nurses' necks. So you can see what the quality of the imaging is like. Now this is a nephrostomy I did with it. Um, this nephrostomy really you could have done without ultrasound at all. Um, you could put your hand on the patient's back I suspect and got a wire into that. It was like a football. But we thought it was a good opportunity to try the technology out. So very good bit of kit. Um, that's only available on Android but on BBC News yesterday I saw this, um, which is an iPhone equivalent from a company called Butterfly Networks in the US. Now you can buy one of these allegedly for £1,555. This is frightening because I think everyone now can be their own ultrasound expert. So this could well produce a lot of problems for us. So we're now putting in a lot of these covered stents in patients. So this is one called the Uventa, uh, we could use for malignant ureteric strictures. I say malignant in, this pa in these patients because this is very hard to remove. The other stent we use is something called the allium stent, and this is easier to remove, but because it's easier to remove, it also is slightly more prone to migration. Um, but these stents can mean that patients don't have to come back for recurrent stent changes, particularly if they've got a long-term stricture or a malignant condition. This patient has a distal left ureteric occlusion due to extrinsic compression from a large pelvic tumour. It was decided to place a uventa stent for more long-term drainage. As the catheter is withdrawn, you can see the stricture. A stiff guide wire is then passed through the stricture into the bladder, followed by insertion of the uventa stent. Once across the stricture, it's slow the covering is slowly withdrawn, releasing the stent, and you can see it expands fully, allowing contrast to pass. Retrogradely. And there's the contrast going down. And you can put these in. It's a very good result. It should last long term. You can put these stents in either anti through the kidney or retrogradely 
through the ureter. And that's the same with the allium stents. This is an allium stent that's been in for about a year and we're removing with a cystoscope. This was done with one of the urologists. And to remove it, you need to use these rat tooth forceps. They're fairly sharp. And you can see the teeth on the end and you grab one of those struts you saw on the picture. And when you pull it, the whole stent unravels. The plastic bits in between almost perforated and the whole thing just unravels and you take the stent out through the urethra and this is what it looks like afterwards it looks like a bit of a mess but you can see how it's unraveled between all these struts and you can then go back and you can put another one of these in and we've had these in for two years in some patients with not too much incrustation the other thing we do now is prostate artery embolization so 25 percent of patients with benign prostatic enlargement fail medical therapy um, so they need to go on and have some sort of surgery. Now the problems with the surgery at the moment are they lead to they can, surgery can lead to impotence, urethral strictures, urinary incontinence, retrograde ejaculation, sepsis and hemorrhage, all these things you really don't want to have. So we have been embolizing prostates for many years. We've been doing it for carcinoma, uh, post biopsy, bleeding post biopsy, post TURP. And what these people noticed in 2000 was they had a patient with hematuria which was persistent, they embolized them, their PSA decreased by 90% and their prostate volume reduced dramatically and their international prostate symptoms score, that's the urinary symptoms, also improved dramatically. So people started thinking, hang on a minute, this is a good technique, this is a bit like fibroid embolization. So one of the leaders in this is Carnivali and he's done an awful lot of these patients and this was first published in 2009. And since then, we've um, done a lot of these. We've been part of the ROPE study nationally, which has shown that it's a very good technique and it does work and it's now approved by NICE. It's not an easy technique. Um, you have to have good working relationship with, with your urology colleagues who will refer you to patients. The ideal patient has a big gland. They're not too old, so the vessels aren't too difficult to work in. And of course, they need to have a functioning bladder. So they need a good urology workup to see if they're suitable beforehand. Now the problem is, we'll just go down through the CT scan, is the arteries are tiny. The prostate artery is that thing there. And it really is very hard to see on CT and very hard to get into angiographically. And I'll show you how we do that. So you do a CT first to check the vessels are suitable, check you can even see them. We then do a single, usually single femoral puncture over the bifurcation. That's the prostatic artery. There it is with an oblique view, and we need to get out here. And this is actually one of the larger prostatic arteries we see. And once we get down with a microcatheter, we inject contrast, and you can see half of the prostate gland taking up the contrast. So we know we're in the right place, but we do need to check that none of these vessels are going off down to the penis or anything else that we don't want to embolize. So there, you'll do a cone beam CT. This is the room I showed you before. So the whole thing can swing around and there's a very basic CT scan. You get an image like this where half the gland is lighting up and contrast is going nowhere else. So we know that we're safe to go on and embolize. And we then embolize this with particles of PVA. And generally, this is a quality of life score. You can see how things can improve after a month and even longer. What we don't know is how long this is going to last for. We don't know whether patients are going to only last for three or four years or 10 years, or even a year. So some of these patients may well go on to need surgery ultimately. I then have a Wednesday lunchtime urology meeting. This is a bit of a mashup. We get all sorts thrown at us. None of these images are seen beforehand. It's stuff from across the region. It's benign cases, malignant cases, absolutely anything that the urologists who work with the hub and spoke arrangement aren't really sure about or they want a second opinion on. And that's often quite an interesting, interesting meeting. Thursday morning, uh, like today, I do my CT list. We got two, two CT scanners, both semen scanners. This is the one where I tend to do most of my lists. And that's the little reporting area where we sit and listen to the radio operas gossip. And this is a dual source scanner, uh, which we have over the other side of the department. Um, we don't really use it as dual source very much. Um, we haven't found that to be a great benefit. So during my CT, I do post-ablation follow-ups. I do living-related renal donors, patients who investigate patients with loin pain, hematuria, renal masses, miscellaneous inpatient CT. 
I also do my ablations and biopsies and drainages on this list. We have patients like this, pre-contrast scan, you can see a little fatty lesion, that's an angiomyolipoma. We evaluate renal enhancement in renal masses. This has gone from 51 to 73. This is enhancing renal mass, therefore it needs treatment. It's probably a small RCC. It's not the only way you can tell enhancement, of course. You can do contrast ultrasound. There's the grayscale image. This is the contrast coming in. And you'll see the renal mass starting to take up contrast here peripherally. So contrast ultrasound is actually a very good way to measure enhancement if you can see the lesion. We get patients with renal trauma. 16 year old girl fell out of a haystack and believe it or not, she landed on her friend's elbow. Bizarre, but this is what happened to her. There's a right kidney, a lot of fluid in the abdomen, a bit of kidney still enhancing, but the top half of the kidney is gone. So a kidney's in two halves, but something else has gone as well. If you look carefully, there's a pancreas. A pancreas has been neatly cut in two as it was sandwiched between the elbow, I would suggest, and the spine. And you can see one of her renal arteries has dissected and she's lost part of the kidney and she's also got a urinoma around it. So the oldest said to us, can we do anything about this? And we decided to do absolutely nothing because ultimately she was going to need an nephrectomy. We could have put drains in, we could have tried to re-establish uh, drain the collection, put a, put a um, ureteric stent in, but really it wasn't worth it. She would have had lifelong problems with that kidney. And as it happened, she went on and she ended up with a whipple for a pancreas as well. So really it was a very nasty injury. The other thing I do is ablation. We've got a variety of ablation techniques. We've got RFA, microwave, cryo, IRE. Um, I'm using microwave most of the time at the moment. Uh, this heats up the water molecules. Um, the particular machine we've got it's got a very bright needle. It's very easy to see on ultrasound. Here we've taken a kamikaze approach through the liver into the small renal mass. And once we're into that, we can just heat it up. There it is there. And there it is post-ablation a week later. No enhancement. And that's worked very well. We do combined procedures. We sometimes go into theatre and work in between the arms of the robot and the arms of the surgeon. It's a patient who had a partial nephrectomy from the robot and had a couple of small renal tumours in the upper pole we just had to go on and the blade, so we got the laparoscopic ultrasound machine in. That's my needle coming in percutaneously into the tumour, and there's the tumour on the ultrasound machine. And you'll see the needle going, so yeah, the urologist can see the tumour, so it must be in the right place. And eventually you'll see some steam coming off that tumour as it's bubbling away, and that's us cooking it. Problems with thermal ablation as it damages structures around the kidney as well, or structures running through the kidney, and it's unpredictable. So really, we want something that's the ideal thing, gives them a predictable ablation, gives large volumes, can ablate different types of tissue, and doesn't have thermal electrical sink effects. And it doesn't damage surrounding structures. Does this exist? Well, it probably does. It's IRE, irreversible electroporation. This is something we've started doing relatively recently in the urinary tract. The way this works is you put two electrodes across the tumour and you essentially electrocute it with high voltage pulses. And this opens up the cell membrane pores and then the cells lies. The advantage of this, as you can see, the blood vessel going through the middle of this tumour is not affected and the tissues grow back, the cells grow back into it, whereas the tumour doesn't grow back. Problem is it's got to be done under general anaesthetic, it's CT guided and you have to get your needles absolutely parallel because of the electrical field. And that's actually fiendishly difficult in the kidney because the ribs are in the way. So you have to get your needles evenly spaced, parallel and in between the ribs at some point. So this is just setting it up. It's a great box of tricks. I need some help doing that. It's fairly complicated. And once you've got it running, you can see the convulsions it causes in the patient. And this is after they're paralyzed. It's making all the muscles contract. Give a lot of pulses and it does actually work very well. But it's an expensive treatment. I then have my urology cancer MDT in the Thursday afternoon. Um, highlight of my week in inverted commas. It didn't used to be, but since the appointment of two new colleagues, 
over the last uh, five to ten years, things have dramatically improved. So now we do the MDT two weeks after three. Um, so this week was my week off and it gave me a chance to try and fill, finish off this presentation for this evening. Um, so we do 15 patients each. Um, some of them are local, but a lot of them are super regional uh, around the northern region from further afield. And we insist on reviewing all these patients beforehand. The cutoff for reviewing patients is five o'clock on the Tuesday. So any patient submitted after that will not be reviewed unless it's a clinical. There's a major clinical urgency. They'll be put on the next week's meeting. So we're very adamant about reviewing patients beforehand, which I think is very important because some of them are fairly complicated. This one's not so complicated. This is a patient with, you can see, tumour thrombus in the IVC and a large renal tumour, the thrombus coming across the midline into the IVC. It's also coming into the retroaortic renal vein and down the gnabal vein. So really a very bad tumour. The urologists often ask us to do an MR as well because they, they think it's going to look better. I think this stems from the days when coronal reconstructions on CT weren't so good, but here you can see actually uh, the MR looks just like a CT scan. And there it is coronally, there it is in the renal vein, there it is in the retroaortic renal vein, and it's going up into the adrenal gland as well. So a nasty tumour. Fridays um, is my all-day interventional radiology list, alternate weeks. So a colleague and, my, um, and myself uh, about six months ago decided rather than doing half a day each, we would alternate and do a full day, which really has been transformational. So tomorrow... I get a day off, so I can't wait. So in summary, um, so that was a bit of a rattle through, there's a lot to get through there. Euroradiology has not stood still. And if your job is anything like mine, you won't stand still either. Um, there's been changes in CT technology, ultrasound technology, MRI technology, and advances in Euro intervention. There's great scope for collaboration with the urology colleagues, um, both clinically and academically. And as a bunch of people to work with, I think the urology surgeons and nephrologists are absolutely superb. Um, they're very human. I'm not saying other surgeons aren't human, but I'd say they are probably the most human out of them all and probably the most normal. If you want a varied and interesting week, become a uroradiologist. If you want to work with great clinical colleagues, become a uroradiologist. See, there's a bit of a theme running here. If you want to work in a field with a mixture of diagnostic and intervention sessions, become a uroradiologist and you can very much make your job plan a mix how you want it and for myself I think I've got the perfect mix during the week. So if you want any further information, if you want any of these things, speak to any of us at the BSUR, that's the British Society of Urogenital Radiology or at the college and that's the URL for the BSUR website. Um, do come along to the joint BUSGAR and BSUR annual meeting which is the beginning of next month. And um, this is what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, hopefully. So thank you very much. I think we'll wrap it up there. And I think we're probably going to be able to uh, have time for a few questions. Right. Let me just look what questions we've got here. So um, is there a role for a non-interventional uroradiologist? That was from Chris Carr. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is because, as I said, you can do as much intervention or non-intervention as you like. And some of my colleagues who do joint GI and your intervention, the euro part is purely diagnostic. They might do some biopsies and drainages, but the rest of their, their role is purely diagnostic. Um, another question is, how many uroradiologists are there in your department and do they all do this volume of intervention like you? Um, there's three of us mainly who do the euro and I'm the only one who does a lot of the intervention. Uh, one of my colleagues, I showed you some of his ultrasound images, he does quite a lot of biopsies and drainages, and some of that, of course, is euro as well, um, but they don't do the intervention like I do. Uh, one of my other colleagues who does a lot of vascular intervention, he does the euro intervention as well, but does none of the euro diagnostic work. So you can see there's a, there's a real mix, and it very much depends on the department you work in and how you want to make your job work. Um, another question here is, What's the follow-up protocol for hyperdense renal cysts in your department? Well, a hyperdense renal cyst doesn't need any follow-up because, by definition, it's a Bosniak type 2 cyst and there's no significant risk of malignancy. You just have to prove it's hyperdense, first of all, and make sure there's no enhancement. How, how much of IR training is adequate? That's a good question. Now, um, 
Uh, I don't know if Harry's listening. Uh, Harry Barnett, who's a uroradiologist who works down in the Leeds area, he um, he. I don't think Harry does any of the vascular stuff, and I don't think he's formally trained as IR, but he does a lot of the uro intervention. Um, he doesn't do some of the vascular stuff I do, and I think there certainly is scope for training in uroradiology, doing the IR that you need without doing a formal IR training program. Um, you don't necessarily need to do the three plus three or go away and do an IR fellowship. Um, you know, there is scope to do that around the country, but I'm not entirely sure where you would go to get that. But if you want to speak to anyone about that, I could recommend you speak to Harry Bargett. Uh, another question about complex renal cysts and at what intervals. So how long do you follow up the complex renal cysts and at what intervals? Now, by complex, that will be Bosniak 2F, which is for follow-up, or Bosniak 3s. Not all our Bosniak 3s get operated on. Uh, we kind of fudge them a bit because some of our Bosniak 3s, we look at them, although they're technically a 3, we're not that worried about them. So we do a CT to classify them, first of all. Occasionally it's MR or contrast-enhanced ultrasound, but usually it's CT. Uh, we would then follow them up for five years with ultrasound and we would fill it, finish off with a CT or an MR to see if there's been any change. And if at five years there's been no change, we would discharge them. Now, there's another question here at the end. Um, are there avenues for IR Euro training for a radiologist? Well, I think that overlaps with my answer to a previous question. There are. Uh, there are places around the country who will be able to provide you with that training, but I couldn't tell you specifically where to go. But again, I think speaking to Harry Barnett would probably be a good idea. Sorry, Harry, if you're listening. Right, I think there's one more there. Are we doing contrast for all prostate MRI? Uh, that's a great question. We started doing contrast, and then I decided it didn't really help, and I stopped doing contrast, and then... We started doing contrast again, and I'm convinced that contrast does help. So now, uh, on my list, I will do give contrast for anyone I think or suspect has got prostate cancer or I'm looking for a change. And these are even the patients who are, on, who are going to be going on to active surveillance. I'll do a post-contrast scan on them as well. Then I can compare the original one where we gave gadolinium to the current one. So I think contrast is useful. There are papers say, um, saying otherwise. I think the jury is out, and I think it depends on how good your diffusion-weighted imaging is and how confident you are uh, with what you're seeing. But giving contrast really doesn't take very long. It adds two minutes to the scan. You don't need to go out to five minutes. You don't need to look at wash out. You just look at wash in. Um, so adding two minutes, I think, is nothing. And if you do the contrast, you can cut out your T1-weighted scans as well because the contrast is T1, so you're going to see any hemorrhage or high signal T1 before you give the gadolinium. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, we give contrast. Another question, do you do MRI prostate on 1.5T or 3T? Well, as I said, we've only got a 1.5T scanner, uh, or two 1.5T scanners in this trust. Uh, we do have a research 5T scanner, uh, but we haven't done any prostates on it at the moment. So 1.5T, really good quality 1.5T, uh, is sufficient and it, it very much depends on how good your coils are and how good the gradients are. It's not necessarily a strength and magnetic field that gives you good images. Uh, someone else has just asked what subspecialties go well with uroradiology from a diagnostic and or interventional perspective? Well, I think the clue was probably in our joint BSUR and Buzgar meeting which we're having at the beginning of February. This is the first time we've done a joint meeting and I think GI goes very well with GU. Um, there is overlap and obviously if you're imaging the GI tract you tend to image the GU tract at the same time and vice versa. So there certainly is some overlap there. And from the interventional point of view the overlap is probably more with biliary. Uh, a question, do you ever get any problems during the collaborative procedures with the urologist? No, not at all. Um, I think we, we work with a huge amount of mutual respect in our department. And um, the only times I've ever had any problems might be with a urology junior who um, was perhaps being a bit overzealous during the PCNL when his consultant senior had gone out of the room. I'd have to tell him to stop if I thought he was doing something dangerous. Uh, but generally, no, we work really well and we work as a team. I do things they can't do well. They do things I can't do well. And that's the way it works best. Right. I don't think there's any more questions at the moment. And I'm guessing we're probably out of time now. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen, everybody. It's, um, 
even though I couldn't see you all. Um, I hope you enjoyed it.